The views and opinions expressed by our guests on Debunked are their own and do not reflect the views of Utah State University or our sponsors. Also, just heads up, there's some strong language on this episode. Now for the show. That's why I'm so grateful to be recovering today because there's so many different ways to do it. People deserve to recover in whatever way they want. People have inherent worth. They have the same amount of inherent worth, whether they're injecting heroin, whether they're on methadone, whether they're totally abstinent, whether they've never used any drugs in their lives. People treat overdose like it's an end thing. Like once somebody's overdosed and died, they're a statistic and that's the end of it. But that's not the end of it. That was the beginning of it for me. Welcome to Episode 7 of Debunked, the only Utah podcast combining evidence-based health practices with storytelling to challenge the stereotypes and debunk the myths about harm reduction, opioids, and substance use disorders. I'm Tim Light, and today we will be discussing the myth that the only legitimate treatment for addiction is abstinence. In this conversation, we'll talk about Medication for Addiction Treatment, or MAT, how long it's been around and some of the barriers preventing people from utilizing and accessing MAT. We'll also talk about different forms of treatment for substance use disorders, abstinence being just one of them. And we'll finish by hearing a heart-wrenching story about why this matters. Before we jump into the conversation, let's first have our guests introduce themselves. Hello, friends. My name is Mindy Vincent. I'm the founder and executive director of the Utah Harm Reduction Coalition. I have a private practice, Life Changes Counseling in Hebrew, Utah, and I'm the podcast host of Therapeutic Madness. Dun, dun, dun. I'm Erin Madden. I'm a research assistant professor at the University of New Mexico in the Department of Internal Medicine. I am a sociologist and health science researcher by training. Uh, my research focuses on addiction treatment and stigma, or sort of the idea that some people are on the receiving end of prejudice or discrimination because of some of their sort of traits or identities. Hi guys, my name is Ashanti. I'm the Outreach Director for Warrior Spirit Recovery. We are a Native American facility located in Tooele, Utah. I also am very active in our community. I probably volunteer as much as I work, so that really balances out my life. I, I do things like YPR, which is Young People in Recovery, and League of Women Voters, which is what it sounds like. Woo -woo. So there we go. Okay, so again, the myth that we are debunking today is the only legitimate treatment for addiction is abstinence. So I want to first hear one or two sentences from each of you about what you think when you hear this myth. So Mindy, do you want to start again? The first thing I think when people say that abstinence is the only pathway to recovery is that that's going to leave a lot of people dead. I just think of all the people that's going to leave behind. Gosh, that's just really profound and sobering yeah you said it's going to leave a lot of people dead is that, is that yeah what it will yeah that will leave a lot of people dead and it also leaves a lot of people behind because when people are forced to be abstinent and they're not in a place where they're able to maintain abstinence at the time um, or they're not interested in maintaining abstinence at the time then they're at much higher risk for overdose and death you know and I know a lot of people who died trying to get sober and that's why I also hate it when people say, if you just want it bad enough, you know, I knew a lot of people that want it bad enough that are dead today. And I attended their funeral and I know for sure I, that they wanted it bad enough as their therapist. And it's, you know, because I lost my sister to overdose, it's deeply personal to me and all my, all my clients too, you know, love is love. I loved my clients and I buried over 40 of them. And so to me, it's like really personal and it's, it's horrifyingly damaging and frightening when people close the gates of recovery like that again i'm just like moved over 40 people of your clients people that you've worked with personally it's so often like my favorites too like the world is just a darker place without their bright spirits here do you think that it could have been different for them had abstinence not been pushed so hardly or how could it have been different what could we have changed yeah know? so for, there's a few things that need to change. Like one, just the stigma, the stigma that exists in recovery alone, that in itself will kill people. Like, cause it doesn't even matter if providers say, yeah, medication for addiction treatment is just as valid a pathway as, as abstinence. It doesn't matter if I'm saying that as a therapist, you know, and they're just quietly shunned or, or people can't even talk about that any, at all. 
or talk about anything but abstinence because then people will say that they're not really in recovery and all these other things. So those stigmas alone, they're the most damaging for sure. And, and that stigma, um, if I understand correctly, is coming from the treatment community itself, like other people who are in, in treatment or in recovery. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, it's primarily the recovery community. And I was a guilty member of that for a long, long, long time. You know, I truly believe that 12 steps was the best way for people to recover. I did have to recover through abstinence. You know, today I'm just normal. Like I'm recovered from addiction. It's part of who I used to be. It's not a part of who I am. But yeah, there's many people who who die trying to get sober or who can't maintain abstinence or don't want to. So then they're excluded from, you know, they're kicked off the islands of recovery. And so then they don't have the support that we know is so crucial to people maintaining any positive change in their life. Because to me, recovery is any positive change, right? It's uh, it's not so black and white and measured by just abstinence. That would be ridiculous. We know that so many things cause addiction. So why would we think that just one thing measures like the growth of or recovery of it? You know what I mean? Yeah, totally. It's a great point. That's why I'm so grateful to be recovering today because there's so many different ways to do it. And I like it. I like exactly what you said. Any type of change inside of yourself, if you feel something and it no longer sits with you or it's doing more damage to you as a human soul in this existence and you let it go, like that needs to be acknowledged. That needs to be embraced and just cared for. And the only way we can do that in a community is by saying, however you are need this we will get it to you and we will find a means to meet you there yeah totally thanks Ashanti that was beautiful can you just light lay that out for us one more time what is the first thing that comes to your mind there's so many different questions that start to arise and I know so I'm a person in long-term recovery which means that I choose to live you know, free from drugs and alcohol and mind altering substances today. But that path where I am today came from methadone clinics. That path came from going to the doctor, it came from hospital bouts where they prescribed me medication. And I really like to think of it like depression, right? Sometimes depression can be this bout in your life where it just looms and lingers for a little while. Or sometimes that looming and lingering is like 10 years. And it's really hard to decide where you are on that line. So when I hear there's only one path to recovery and that's abstinence, I just feel, I feel afraid too. Like there's going to be a lot of people that miss that ship. I see this important need in our community where we just create space and whatever that space looks like when I initially talk to a potential client, I'm like, look, I'm here to walk this path with you. There's no judgment. And when I say there is no judgment, that means I don't care if you call me hi. I don't care if it's the 15th time you've called me. I don't care if you're asking me, where is there a safe place? Where can I get detox? Where can I get this? I just care that you call me. I care that you are feeling some type of fire inside of you that says, I need help with this situation. And that's that's who I am. I just want to create this space where you're just safe. There's just a safety net. Your life is valuable. Yeah. I just want to highlight what you said right there. Your life is valuable. Everyone's lives are valuable, right? Like you can't even quantify the value of someone's life. I feel like it's just so valuable. And not just when they're abstinent. So we celebrate people for their years of abstinence, which is wonderful, right? But we celebrate people for their abstinence. We celebrate them when they're in their recovery. And what that does, it sends this message that you were never good enough until you achieved this status here. So then when people fall from that status, they're so embarrassed and ashamed that it's so hard for them to even get back. But people have inherent worth. They have the same amount of inherent worth, whether they're injecting heroin whether they're on methadone, whether they're totally abstinent, whether they've never used any drugs in their lives. People have the same inherent amount of work, period. And it is not relying upon abstinence. And somebody who has abstinence has no greater recovery than somebody else who's just overcome. You know what I mean? Yeah, totally. Erin, what do you think when you 
hear this myth? I hear when someone says that their only experience with addiction is maybe what's portrayed on television. So when you think about what treatment looks like on television, all you really see are 12 step groups. So Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, and maybe residential treatment for 30 or 60 days. And all of those are what we call abstinent based treatments usually. And so they're saying, you know, your sort of value, which is what Mindy and Ashanti have been saying is, is sort of calculated based on how many days you have without using your illicit substance of choice, or maybe all illicit substances and alcohol as well. And so and we're going to cut you out of our lives. Yeah. Don't, right. Don't forget the intervention, Erin. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so it makes me think people have watched a lot of intervention or shows with Dr. Drew, which are all very abstinent based sort of ways of talking about treatment and recovery. And what's interesting is those shows are actually not what the science says about what works to address addiction. And what works in the science are these harm reduction approaches. And some people would put medications for addiction treatment in harm reduction. Some people would say they're, they're slightly different. But basically what the science says is there's so much we can do for people while they're using drugs before they're ready to stop using illicit substances. So we can do things like make sure they don't get an infectious disease. We can do things like make sure that they have housing, which these are all harm reduction interventions. And then for people maybe who are willing and ready to stop, there are these medications that most people don't know about. And if they know about them, they tend to have pretty negative perceptions of them. But these medications are backed by a lot of science and they work. But what it sounds like when I hear someone say only abstinence is what we can do is that they don't know about these things or they have misconceptions of those things. I know that it is a bias and it's a personal bias for most of them because many of us that work in the field are in recovery or were recovered, right? And many of whom recovered through 12 steps. So I, being a guilty one, I is absolutely guilty of this. I take my experience and I generalize it to everyone else. You know, and it's like, well, this is what worked for me. So that's what must work for you, you know? And it was through a very painful personal experience of losing my sister and trying to save my brother's life that I learned that that is not going to work, that I had to stop doing that. I was a practitioner for five years before that, you know, where I literally told people I preferred not to take people who were on methadone because I felt like it was a crutch. So yeah, like I had these judgments and I've seen them and I continue to see them in treatment. In fact, I was asked last week if I would speak at a treatment center, but then they called me back. This girl messaged me back and said, oh, you know, this person I know in recovery that works there, they said that you can't come speak to them here because you drink. And that's just an example. Like, really? it's like That's like the kind of biases and such that exist. They exist very much in treatment. And as a provider, it makes me mad because people knowingly opt for their bias because there's just something about addiction treatment there's something about us identifying as addicts and then identifying later as people in recovery that gives us this really strong personal like buy-in to to holding on to these boxes and these stigmas and such and I think most of the time it comes from a good place and sometimes it just comes out of ignorance yeah and that's dangerous because you have other people's lives in your hands and as practitioners we are taught that, you know, we need to recognize our biases and do what we need to do to put them to the side or to address them in a way that's appropriate clinically. And I don't see that happen ever, you know, because yeah. people come into treatment. And the first thing we do is, is we tell them, we don't ask people when they come into treatment, unless they're coming into my treatment program, what their goal is for recovery. Like, what do they want their recovery to look like? Immediately when people go into treatment, it's like, okay, well, you know, you're going to be abstinent. So, and then the most we ask them is, well, what's your pathway of recovery? Like, are you going to go to... 12 steps or are you going to go to smart recovery or life ring like that's the most that's the most extensive I hear people talk about pathways to recovery and do you think maybe that's just because or at least part of it is because people just don't know that there are other options no every people know everybody knows about medication assisted therapy they've known about it for a while and people have known the methadone exists Aaron's right people have a negative connotation of it you know what you hear other people in the same group of treatment, residential treatment, say about people who are on methadone? They talk about how they're nodding out in group. They talk about how they're still getting high and da-da-da. Even though methadone doesn't even have those effects, except for maybe at the very beginning when people are getting stabilized. And they do go in the morning 
to get their methadone. And then they come to group and people fall asleep in group dead sober. Group could be boring, dude. <laughs> and, but if you're on methadone and you start to nod out, it's your methadone, da, 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 you know? And people in, in meetings really do tell other people, like if you're on methadone or suboxone, you're not really sober. And, you know, so no, people do know there's options and people are afraid to seek those options because of the stigma. And many treatment centers don't allow those options. You know, and and we haven't even gotten into the fact that like, what about people who are like, God, you know, I'd sure like to stop smoking crack, but I still plan on having a beer now and again. So, you know, I mean, we, we can't even let people have those kind of discussions in treatment either. And so how's treatment really supposed to be effective? Do you think everybody who goes into treatment is like, yes, I'm going to remain drug and alcohol free for the rest of my life. I wanted to pause for a second to play a clip from episode five of Debunked. In this clip, Dr. Aaron Fanning Madden speaks objectively about 12-step programs such as AA and NA. And I think it's really important and adds a lot to this conversation. We do want to honor the stories of people who have been helped by AA and NA while recognizing that some of the messages that are commonly used in AA and NA groups can be harmful and are not evidence-based. So for example, as I said earlier, many AA and NA groups think the use of medications for addiction treatment is not acceptable. However, the American Society of Addiction Medicine, the American Medical Association, considers these medications the first line of care and essential care for people who have opioid use disorders and alcohol use disorders. Currently, such medications do not really exist for other types of addictions, such as cocaine use disorders, though there is some promising research that means that maybe we will have these medications someday. And I just want to read a quote from someone who works in harm reduction about their experience with NA and AA. So this is a person who is a harm reduction practitioner in Austin, Texas, and he said, the 12-step fellowship saved my life. But in that fellowship, we probably kill more people than we help. I have a friend that was told by a gentleman in AA that he would only sponsor my friend if he got off methadone in six months. My friend did it and relapsed within seven days and died. So I think it's really important that we hold NA and AA to the standard of science while also recognizing the significant good that they have done in a lot of people's lives. I think yeah. most people who go into treatment though, if they're if they're at the point of seeking treatment, right? There's something that's happening in their life getting them there. And right. there's probably a lot of social influences maybe from, you know, spouses or loved ones whatever who are saying, you know, I require abstinence and that's my Thing. So you need to go there and you need to seek abstinence because that's what's right. And I think that's another group of people that we need to address, right? Yes, because that's dangerous. Yeah, First that's of all, so you're not a professional. You don't know anything about addiction or treatment. So, you yeah. know, like second of all, like you don't get to decide what works for other people. And if you really don't want your loved one to die, then let's support their pathway to recovery so they can stay alive. That doesn't mean we don't hold boundaries. But yeah, we right. have to educate people. Tough love's dangerous. And I know a lot of moms who can't sleep at night because the last interaction they had with their kid was one that they can't live with and their kid went out and died. And I hate to bring those things up, but they're real life facts that really do happen. It's true. And anybody who has a child or just a loved one in general, but I mean, speaking from the perspective of a parent, my own perspective, I cannot imagine the anguish that would cause me if that happened to my child. I just can't even, I don't even want to go there, you know? And so- This is such an important topic. We have to take a break. After the break, we're going to talk about what uh, medication for addiction treatment or MAT. It used to be called medication assisted treatment, but now it's being called medication for addiction treatment. We're going to talk about what that is, how long it's been around, and some of the barriers preventing people from utilizing and accessing it. So we'll be right back. Hey, listeners, the information on the show is so important. So relevant and definitely information that more people need to hear. So please, 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 please take a minute to rate and review the show. Even if it's a bad review, we still want it. There's something about the algorithm. The more reviews, the more debunked shows up in people's feeds. So rate and review. Thanks. The Debunked Podcast is made possible by our members and the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration Rural Opioid Technical Assistance Program, offering programs to address barriers of access to rural communities related to opioid use disorder and Regents Blue Cross Blue Shield of Utah works to transform healthcare from the inside out. We reduce confusion, waste, and red tape for members as we help them navigate the healthcare system. Welcome back to Debunked. 
The myth that we are debunking today is the only legitimate treatment for addiction is abstinence. So right now we're going to talk about what is medication for addiction treatment or MAT, how long it's been around and some of the barriers preventing people from utilizing and accessing MAT. So Aaron, can you tell us what medication for addiction treatment is and sort of how long it's been around? Yeah, there are uh, three primary medications that are used to treat um, opioid use disorder. And there are some different ones that are used to treat alcohol use disorder. There are not medications to treat some other types of addictions like amphetamine use disorders, cocaine use disorders. Those are not available yet, though there are some promising research. So I do think in the next decade, we will have some. For opioid use disorder, for addiction to heroin or prescription painkillers, the three medications that exist are methadone, a medication called buprenorphine, and then another one called naltrexone. Um, Methadone is really just the generic methadone. You go to a methadone clinic and you usually get dosed every day. And for buprenorphine, it's usually given in a monthly prescription, and most people access a brand name called Suboxone. There are generics, though, of buprenorphine that are cheaper. And Suboxone is a drug that combines buprenorphine and naloxone. Um, Naloxone is an overdose reversal drug. And basically why it has that is buprenorphine, if you were to crush it or try to liquefy it to either snort it or inject the drug, the naloxone would activate and it would put you into withdrawal. So it's kind of what they call an abuse deterrent so that people don't try to get high off of their Suboxone. Was the Naloxone always in Suboxone, Erin? Yes, always in Suboxone, yes. but okay. there are types of buprenorphine like Subutext that do not have naloxone. So buprenorphine and methadone are what we call an opioid agonist. So what that means is that they are themselves opioid drugs, but they do not function the same way as prescription opioids or as heroin. So methadone and buprenorphine do not function exactly the same way as drugs that are used to sort of get high. So like heroin or a short acting painkiller that's based on an opioid. They are long acting opioid agonists, which means that they are opioids themselves, but they sort of operate on a much slower time frame. So basically all they function to do for someone who is addicted to opioids is that they kind of stabilize their system. They do not produce any highs and they keep that person from experiencing a severe physical withdrawal that happens when you're addicted to opioids and you stop using them. So these drugs are used to make sure someone does not experience a very painful withdrawal. It makes sure they don't have cravings and they effectively also block the effect of other opioids because you're already taking an opioid when you take methadone or buprenorphine, your opioid receptors are already covered. So if you were to take heroin on top of it, it really wouldn't have any effect if you're dosed at the right amount. You can still overdose on these drugs because they are still opioids. Which is why it has to be an appropriate dose and it's monitored by a physician or other healthcare professional, correct? Yeah, so it has to be a prescriber. So a doctor um, has to prescribe methadone, a physician. For buprenorphine, it could be a physician's assistant or nurse practitioner. But again, it's someone who is licensed to prescribe. It's a medical professional. There's one more medication, which is called naltrexone, which is an anti-craving drug that is also used to treat alcohol use disorders. Um... It is an opioid antagonist, which means it is not an opioid itself. It covers your opioid receptors so that you can't have any the effects of opioids um, in your body, essentially. All of these drugs have actually been around for a pretty long time, um, since the 1960s or 70s. Yes. Yeah, so methadone has been used to treat opioid addiction since 1964, actually. Um, I'm, so- I'm sorry, everybody. I'm just mind blown that these have been around since 1964. 1964- 1964. There are current clients at methadone clinics who have been on methadone for 20 plus years. Like that's like a totally normal kind of thing. Like probably half and half at methadone clinics are long-term patients versus like ones that want to be on it a couple years. Oh my. Wow. Okay. I'm sorry. Keep going. Aaron. Yeah. So, so it was developed after World War, methadone was developed after World War II when there was a large heroin problem in New York City. 
it became approved by uh, sort of medical authorities in 1964 to be used to treat opioid addiction. Buprenorphine has been along for a long time as well. It was only approved in the US for treatment for opioid addiction since 2002, though countries in Europe have been using it for much longer, since the 90s and maybe even before that. Now, Trexone was approved for opioid use disorders in the mid 80s and then for alcohol use disorders in the mid 90s. So all of these drugs are pretty old. This is not new stuff for people who do addiction medicine, but it is new stuff for the general public. Most people don't know these exist to this day. Which is crazy because even the one that was approved in 2000, that, that's still like 20 years ago. That's not a new drug at all. Wow. So then if they've been around for a long time, why, why aren't people, you know, utilizing these treatments? What, what are some of these, the barriers, you know, that people are facing? Mindy, what do you think? I would say even before, even higher than stigma, I would say is the fact that most treatment centers don't allow medication assisted treatment or medication assisted recovery. So that is a huge deterrent. Number one, number two, people have these stigmas and these beliefs that come from the recovery community, but then are also internalized and come from themselves that say like, oh, if I'm using this, then I'm not really sober. And then there's also a group of people who are just afraid to carry on the dependency because methadone and suboxone, subutex, all of these medication, they all, well, with the exception of naltrexone, they do um, have a physical dependency to them, you know, because that's what they're there to prevent, right? So they're not necessarily addictive. In fact, most people who use these medications do not abuse drugs on top of them. That's the vast majority do not. However, they do cause a dependency. And for some people, I know plenty of people who are heroin addicts who are like, but I would rather kick heroin cold turkey than be on methadone because methadone is harder for them to kick, you know, but also when you're going through the steps of a program with a doctor, you're, you're appropriately tapered. And so you really don't experience a lot of withdrawal symptoms, right? So there's a few things that prevent people, but I think that overall, um, I think it's just this, the long standing stigma you're really only sober if you're sober. And so, that's really the only thing that recovery is, is sobriety. And that's just not true. So a kind of a side note, what is the difference for people listening? What's the difference between dependence and addiction? Dependence is just where your body is physically dependent on it. So like people who take opioids for a long period of time, in fact, seven days is all it takes to get, gain a physical dependency. That doesn't mean you will. But dependence just means that your body goes through withdrawals when you stop taking it, right? But addiction is where you actually seek the substance despite negative and painful consequences. So like when people say, oh, babies were born addicted, there's never been a baby born addicted to anything in the history of the entire world. And do you know why? Because they cannot seek the substance. They do not meet the criteria for addiction and never, ever will and never, ever have. Thank you. That clears up a lot. So Ashanti, what do you think about some of the barriers facing people trying to seek, you know, medication for addiction treatment? I know from my own personal experience, the barriers for me were one, how was I going to pay for it Two, you know, like I was in the middle of my addiction life. And so that lifestyle that I was living definitely did not give me the means to be able to, you know, like sign up for health insurance or do any of these things within myself, those things were not capable for me. So it, it really came down. Can you purchase those on the street? Kind of like illicit drugs. Can you purchase Suboxone on the street? Can you purchase methadone on the street? Yes. And then once I had experienced that, I was like, Oh, well, maybe that is doable because I can actually get up and go to work and have a job and then start to provide things for my family while I'm on methadone, while I'm on Suboxone, while I'm on Subutex. I can actually do those things. And it's not this consumption of my mind of like, oh man, I have to go do this and it's got to be right now. Like it's, it's okay. I, I can go to work. And And did those things better your life, Ashanti? Did they better your life? They completely bettered my life in every way possible. I, I went to work and then would come home and take care of my daughter and cook dinner and do laundry. However, you know, when I was using the list drugs, those things weren't possible. So, you know, it's the barriers for me were, you know, how am I going to take care of this? How am I going to be able to pay for this? 
the benefit to that was once I was able to, you know, go in, I could pay like the dollar amount, the daily amount in a methadone clinic. And then you gain some trust and you gain a lot of trust within yourself. Like you can actually bring it home and use it on a daily basis without checking in every day and be responsible. And things that worked for me were going in there and, you know, talking to a therapist once a week, you know, like taking some time to talk about what was going on inside of my head really helped me address the behavior of wanting to just become so, I don't know, saturated in drugs. Like I just, if I got in my head, I had to get out of it. And methadone for me was extremely helpful. It was that stark of a difference. Like it was. Oh yeah. Yeah. It was that stark of a difference. And you see results quickly. And I mean, quickly, like 14 day period quickly within 14 days, I was able to have a job for me. Addiction looked like I didn't get out of bed and I was incapable of doing things. Some people are, are different and they're, um, what do you call those? Like a functioning addict. That's what it's like functioning addicts, a functioning addict where you were not one of those. I was not one of those. Can I say something really quick about the barrier Shanti was talking about? Yeah. Because, well, because there's a barrier in itself to the barriers that Shanti was talking about. Like when she said something about when I was able to take my medication home because I was responsible enough to do that. I have to say that uh, people should never have to jump through hoops for these medications ever. And they do all the time. Like that's totally normal. What she's talking about is totally normal. You have to earn take home doses. Nobody should earn medications. And what is one of the barriers that gets in the way is when people are on methadone, they have to be up at like five o'clock in the morning. And Shanti, what time did you have to go get yours? Five in the morning. People have, you know how hard it is for normal people to be up at five in the morning? Those are not for the most part. Can we just pause for a second and just ask the listeners, how many of you could get up at five o'clock every morning to do any, like how many of you actually do that? And that's That's just one piece. You not only do you have to be there every morning at 5 a.m. to get your dose, right? But like that has to go on for a certain period of time and you have to jump through these hoops and do drug tests and do other things to show that you're doing enough to recover or they will cut you off your methadone. That's insanity. Have you ever seen somebody cut off their insulin? Yes. And have you ever seen somebody cut off insulin because they ate a Twinkie? Absolutely not. But we do it all the time to people on methadone. My brother-in-law has been on methadone for like probably three years now, right? But he was on it for about, two years or so when um like he and my sister are married obviously right and like they work opposite work schedules my brother-in-law could not be at the groups at the methadone clinic because he's watching the kids and so because he couldn't be at the groups he couldn't get more take-homes he could only get this many right yeah which again it's not like abstinence can be a great goal for some people and it's exactly what they need right i was absent for nine years i love abstinence i love 12 steps it's not for everybody but yeah it's not and it's leaving out this huge group of people and it's preventing them from getting the treatment that they need erin what were you going to say i was going to say everything that mindy and ashanti are saying are backed up by tons of research like these barriers are real these two people are not alone in these stories And I do want to say, though, that there is some really interesting new research on what's called medication first programs, which are programs that offer methadone and buprenorphine with very low barriers. So what that means is people do not have to have these long records of adherence. They don't have to show that they're abstinent from other drugs. They don't have to attend group therapy. They just get medication up front with sort of like pretty much very few rules. And the goal of those programs is to get more people sort of on the track to get some treatment without making these barriers and rules for each clinic so hard. And the research is showing that these are working for getting people to engage in services more and more and to engage in treatment more and more. Um, And also for people who maybe just want the medication, they're not going to be abstinent from other drugs. For them, it's been shown to improve their health outcomes, though. So not everyone wants to enter a medication first program to then be more involved in treatment going forward. That's not what everyone wants. And that's okay. For some people, right, the medication first still improves their outcomes because they're not maybe um, injecting unsafely anymore or they're um, sort of you know, taking care of other pieces of their life, like they get housing. So there's lots of ways of thinking about the success of these programs besides saying, 
have they been abstinent from their drug of choice or all drugs because they're enrolled in these programs? That's a metric of success, but it's really not the only one. And what we see is if we look for a broader set of metrics of success, that these sort of medication first programs do have benefits. So like their well-being is increasing from these. That is so incredible. Which is one of the most basic principles of harm reduction. Yeah. Like that's how we base whether or not it's even working. You know, we, we base our outcomes upon whether the community and the individual is achieving the goals that they're looking for, you know. Mm-hmm. Can we talk about the sort of myth about the length of time people can stay on? Ashanti actually was talking about that. So I, I wanted to see maybe if Ashanti wanted to elaborate on sort of this myth that people have that, okay, well, you can be on these medications, but you should just do it for a short-term detox, max a year, and then you got to get off. So I was wanting Ashanti to say more on that. Please. I really feel like what is working for you and what is helping you achieve like Mindy said, your life goals, what is working for you? It is up to us to help bring the space of comfort of like, okay, Suboxone has worked for you for a year and a half and it's probably going to work for you for five years and that is okay. Or it's going to work for you for 10 years. Or if you've been a methadone clinic and you've, you've been there and you're there and in seven months you don't need it anymore, perfect. Two and a half years, perfect. It's not something that I get to decide that works for that person, right? Like that is not up to me. I'm not the judge. I'm not like, I'm not the end all say all like for sure. I have no idea what is going inside of you. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a therapist, right? They don't know either though, Ashanti, FYI. Right? So I just (laughs) like, I just feel like as as a community that is, member. That's a great point though, really. No one can really know what's going on inside of somebody else's head and what's really going to work for them. Sorry, keep going, Ashanti. Yeah, I really just feel like as a community member, somebody who cares about the people that are, you know, kind of going through this struggle of addiction, if they found something that works for them, I'm on board. I am, I'm, I'm on that board with you. Like, what else can I do to help sustain this happiness that you've found you know is it is it going to be exercise is it going to be yoga is it going to be like you take out soda and you drink water any little tiny healthy thing that you want to bring into your life you know and you're open to I'm I'm on board for that 100% and it doesn't matter how long you're on Suboxone that's none of my business and what does the science tell us about that oh that's that's an errand. Yeah, like, Aaron, what, what is it? How long should somebody be on these medications? Or is there a limit? There is no limit. So there is no research that says people should only be on it for X number of years. That is, there's just not a single study that says max a year, max five years. The guidelines from the American Society of Addiction Medicine say that that's a decision between the patient and the prescriber only. And I would hope that the prescriber would be doing a lot of listening to the patient and would not be pressuring patients to what we say, titrate off the medication, which is to sort of wean someone off of it. But I think what Mindy and Ashanti are saying is that we do see treatment professionals and other healthcare professionals doing that to patients. And I want to emphasize that that is not the clinical guidelines that they should be following. Can I just say over over and over again, I keep hearing stories of moms, of sisters, of brothers, of friends who say, if I would have known at the time that my sister, my mom, my brother, my child would have died from an overdose, I would have said, use in front of me, like do whatever it takes to not die. And and they they say over and over again, I wish that the provider would have not titrated my child that early, or I wish that we could have had more listening or something to keep this person alive because once they're gone, what do you do? You You can't get people back. I have to say, like when you say that, so this last year in Utah, here in Utah, uh, we ran um, an overdose prevention site bill and we will run that bill again every year and I will do whatever it takes to get that passed and to get those open. And for those, for that exact, reason because when you said that a mother would say you know what if I'd have known I'd have let him use in front of me and some would say that's insane but it's like so what would you rather your kid go out into the shed outside and just die where you can't even help them if they overdose you know and that's what overdose prevention sites prevent is death 
They are more effective than naloxone. No one has ever died in an overdose prevention site or safe consumption site in the entire world, which does make them the most effective. Overdose prevention sites, safe consumption sites, not one person has ever died in the history of the world in one. And Aaron can back me up on this. It's true. And uh, that makes it the most effective method of over a fatal overdose prevention in the world that we have. And so when people say it's crazy, why would you watch your loved one use? Because I'd rather watch them use and revive them and keep them alive so that they can fight another day than let them die because they deserve to live. And that's another thing. I just have to say this really quick. Like, why are people using drugs? They are typically using drugs to medicate traumas and to medicate the additional things that come along when you start abusing drugs, right? Because it starts to take a toll, starts to go haywire. You start to lose a lot of things. Things start to go crazy, right? So people are ultimately using drugs to medicate. Yet substance abuse treatment is the only treatment that I've ever seen that we require people's outcome before they've even done the work to get there. While people are still struggling, while they still have no coping skills, while they still have no protective factors and high risk factors, and we're telling them, then you have to stop using, you know? Like if you get sober, then I can help you. I can't help you till you get sober. That doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Mindy, you're like making me cry over here on the other side. It's just so. I get, I get crazy, Tim. I get crazy. That was just, it, just, it really is. It's just so People's moving. People's babies are dead over this. Like, this is a really serious thing, you know? Like, it was somebody's brother, somebody's sister, somebody's dad, somebody's mom. It was somebody. And they're all gone. And you're right. When they're gone, we can't get them back. And that's it, you know? And all of our fights about recovery, they didn't even matter because somebody's dead. Yeah. You know? The Debunked Podcast is made possible by our members and USU's Department of Kinesiology and Health Sciences, committed to educating and serving students and members of both local and extended communities in the fields of kinesiology and health science. Information at khs.usu.edu. And the Tribal and Rural Opioid Initiative of Utah State University, an effort to address opioid use among rural Utahns in the hopes of eliminating myths and promoting health. Information at khs.usu.edu.outreach. Welcome back to Debunked. The myth that we are debunking today is the only legitimate treatment for addiction is abstinence. Earlier in the show, we talked about um, medication for addiction treatment, some of the barriers preventing people from utilizing and accessing these types of programs. But really quick, uh, so now we're going to address sort of the efficacy of the drugs, and then also talk about something called diversion um, of these drugs. So Aaron, can you tell us about the efficacy of drugs used for medication for addiction treatment? Yeah, so two of these drugs, to be quite frank, are better than another drug. So methadone and buprenorphine have been shown by a ton of studies. I'm not talking five, 10, I'm talking 50 plus studies. These studies have shown that buprenorphine and methadone are very effective for a few really important outcomes. One is it keeps people in treatment longer. We call that measure retention in treatment. Another really important outcome is it reduces people's use of illicit drugs. And the third is that it actually reduces other illicit activities like you know criminal activity. So sometimes people will have to involve themselves in criminal activity to have the money to buy their substance of choice. Though, of course, not all people, many people remain employed and do not, you know, participate in any sort of criminal activity to buy their uh, substance of choice. Um, So I don't want to imply that that's what everyone's doing. And also buprenorphine and methadone have been shown to reduce overdose. Um, Because of course, if you're not using illicit drugs, you're being dosed by a doctor in your buprenorphine and methadone you're not going to overdose versus if you're buying drugs on the street, you don't know the purity. You don't know if they're the, the sort of strength of those drugs. So you're putting yourself at increased risk from overdosing because you're taking more than you expected, or you're taking a, a drug that maybe has fentanyl in it at concentrations that you weren't expecting. Um, Aaron, do you happen to know how many people continue to use illicit drugs while being prescribed medication for a addiction recovery? I don't know the exact percentages, but I but do it's know, small, right? yeah, once someone is on methadone or buprenorphine, they are much less likely to continue to use illicit drugs than someone who is not on those medications. So someone who is in tr- absent-based treatment and yeah. someone who is in no treatment at all, of course, you know, and I would argue to me, the most important metric is people staying alive. And we know that these drugs keep people alive more than not using those drugs. If you have an opioid addiction. Because again, if someone's alive, 
we're valuing that human life over all other metrics because that is the most important thing, human life, right? Compassion, human life. That's what I think. To yeah. some of us, to yeah. some of us. No. There are plenty of people who do write below like articles get published about like my organization and say, put them on an island, infect them with AIDS and let them die. And that's very sad. But there are some people who really do think that way, which is why it's even more important for those of us who believe their lives are worth it, that our lives are worth it, that everybody's lives are worth it, that we speak up, that we fight, that we do the right thing because there's too many that'll let the right thing not happen. Yeah. Aaron, what were you going to say about alcohol? Yeah, so I was just going to say for, for now, the third drug that's used to treat opioid addiction is naltrexone. It's also used to treat alcohol addiction. It's better than not using any medications, that's for sure. If the only drug you have access to to treat your addiction is naltrexone and you are addicted to opioids, I still think that is better than nothing. It is less effective, however, than buprenorphine and methadone in terms of preventing overdose, preventing illicit drug use, and keeping people in treatment, unfortunately. But it's better than nothing. For alcohol use disorders, it is pretty effective. It is one of the most effective drugs for alcohol use disorders. So again, not every addiction is the same, even if the root causes of addiction tend to be the same, because those are sort of social things like past trauma, poverty, et cetera. But the way the drugs affect your body are not all the same and they respond differently to medications. So if you have an opioid use disorder, I would say the best possible treatment for you is uh, methadone or buprenorphine. Um, if it's an alcohol use disorder, then I would say naltrexone. But again, naltrexone is better than nothing if you have an opioid addiction. And for people who are very highly motivated for abstinence, naltrexone or slash Vivitrol is it, it, it is incredible. I've seen, I mean, I would call it a miracle drug. I've seen it do the most amazing things for people and it's for the right group of people, right? Aaron, like we keep talking about, like it should be client centered and people who are highly motivated for abstinence, Vivitrol specifically because it's an injection that seems to really help people a lot with cravings. Yeah. I will say whatever a patient wants to try should be what we allow them to try. That's right. Absolutely. Patient centered, patient centered. Um, when Ashanti was talking earlier about um, some of the barriers that people face to accessing medication for addiction treatment, Ashanti, you talked about some of those, the barriers that you face personally, you know, like you couldn't get methadone because you were trying, you know, you had to go through like insurance companies. And so you initially got that on the street. Is that correct? Yeah. So I was, you know, I was talking to somebody um, the other day and they were opening up about one of their friends who is um, in the midst of an opioid use disorder. And anyway, diversion came up. Um, Aaron, can you tell us what diversion is? And then let's talk about that and kind of unpack why diversion is happening. So diversion is a term that's used to describe when people take a prescribed medication, actually any prescribed medication, and then sell it to someone who it's not being prescribed for. So you might divert an opioid pain medication that was prescribed to you or someone in your family and you sell it to a friend. You can also divert, of course, though, medication for addiction treatment as well. One of the major concerns of people like the Drug Enforcement Agency, the DEA, about medications for addiction treatment is this idea that people are going to divert them, that they don't really want treatment, that they're going to sell their methadone or buprenorphine on the street. I will say most of us who work in addiction research think that that concern is overblown, that it doesn't happen that often. And when it does happen, it's, you know, people are doing it because they don't have any money and they're just trying to make get by and people are buying it because they miss their dose or they have access problems like Ashanti was describing because they, they don't qualify for insurance. They don't know how to enroll in insurance and they don't have the money. So methadone costs between 11 and $15 a day. Um, if you don't have that 11 or $15 during the few yeah, hours the methadone know. clinic is open, so 5 a.m. to 10 a.m., what are you going to do? And some people very much prefer, uh, so everybody like Aaron has talked about, like people's bodies react differently to medications, right? So like, and Ashanti could speak to this from a personal perspective much better than I could, but people have their preferences of what kind of medication assisted treatments work best for them. So there are many people who, like I said, like I said earlier, you wouldn't find liquid methadone out on the streets, right? Like you're not going to find that, but uh, people are usually looking for Subutex um, or Suboxone. And those things are things that only come from doctors, you know? So that is why 
when people are seeking that on the street, I swear to God, every time I've ever seen, I'm not saying it's never happened, but every time I've ever seen it, it's been somebody who's trying to get off heroin and they don't have the ability to go to the doctor and they don't have the ability to get the prescription. So they have to get it off the streets. And then think about it. The people who are selling them on the streets. Those are people who do have to go to the doctor and then get the Suboxone to sell to people who are just trying to get clean on the streets. Like, I mean, it's, it's up if you ask yeah, me. Best up circle. So Ashanti, what was that like for you personally? Can you just oh. describe to us, you know, you wanted treatment and then found it on the street or how did that work? You want treat? Well, I wanted treatment, right? And so... I would try and make it to the methadone clinic if I didn't have the money and if I didn't have, a, you know, a way or if, you know, because in the beginning, they start you off at a methadone clinic at a smaller amount, and then they'll increase it as your need increases, right? However, you know, like, your need increases and you end up sick in the evening and then you're sick at like three o'clock in the morning or two o'clock in the morning and you can't stop obsessing. For me, I could not stop obsessing about, about drugs and it was just really intense. So then I didn't sleep and my body would go into full withdrawal and by like five o'clock in the morning, you have to wake up. And then for me, it was public transportation. So you have to get on more than one bus to get to the methadone clinic and then you know have the means so if i I just paused right there for just one second ashanti i'm sorry how many of how many utahns could really take public transportation and get somewhere by 5 a.m get somewhere on public transportation by 5 a.m wherever they live and then how many of them could do that if they had the worst flu symptoms of their life the night before leading up into the early hours of the morning and then have to get to that place again one more time on public transportation because 90 percent of this state drives you better live in salt lake that's all i have to say I ashanti mean, what's it like for people in chihuahua <laughs> how many people in chihuahua oh my, can get methadone oh my gosh when i think about even people past chihuahua so what i past chihuahua right and they are traveling an hour into Salt Lake, that is impossible. If it snows, it's impossible. If there's an accident in the morning because of highways or trucks, that's impossible. You're not gonna make it to your methadone clinic. You are not gonna be well, and there's little quotation marks by me, you are not gonna be well for the day. And that means that you are not gonna be a functioning person. You know? Ashanti, will you tell people what well means? I'm sorry, because I think that's important because many people think that people who are on opiates especially are like getting high. Will you tell people what well is so people understand why people need these medications? Yeah, definitely. I'm um so being well means that so for me, I would um my tolerance grew, right? It grew and it grew and it grew. And probably the effect wore off long before I would just accept that effect wearing off. And so being well means that I wasn't sick to my stomach, that I didn't have an extreme headache, that I wasn't in flu-like symptoms, going in hot to cold, hot to cold temperature, you know, that my legs would stop shaking. Being well meant that I could use a small amount or even the thought which is crazy right even the thought of going to have that small amount would kind of sustain your body from being full on sick and i mean like you sometimes you would just have like really bad stomach and that would go into diarrhea that would go into like puking that would go into complete dehydration like there are so many there are so many things I just have to say too, um, I want to give a standing ovation to anybody who is, who is, you know, utilizing methadone and other medication for addiction treatment, because holy cow, how much effort is going into this? You know, like if you are sick the, the night before, and then you have to get up at five in the morning, before five in the morning and get there and take care of your kid and go to work and, 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 I mean, it's just making me emotional because it's like, How dare anybody say that that person's not trying hard enough or that person is not worth it because that person is working harder. Yeah. Or that 
this will bring more harm to our community than it will bring good, right? There's yeah. some communities that just won't even accept there being a clinic where you can get Suboxone and Methadone. You know, they the fear is so real that they reject even allowing that to be in there, that the the city makes it so impossible for the licensing because the people in the community are so upset because that's just going to bring the wrong type of people into their community. And the wrong type of people are the people that are fighting for their lives. For and their we have to let go of that idea that people have to suffer to get better. You know, like it is truly a belief in recovery that you have to suffer, that you have to pay enough, that you have to have earned your seat in the rooms, that there are so many, I could give you a list of 50 of them right off the top of my head that like tell people that you have to suffer in order to get better. You have to hit rock bottom. That's when you hear everybody say, unless people hit rock bottom, rock bottom is death for some people. You know what? And and people don't and have After to, that, there's nothing, right? After that, there's nothing. And you know what? People don't have to suffer in order to get better. And why the hell would we require that of people? Why would we do that? Why would we, people who are already struggling and suffering and have been through enough, why would we continue to make them suffer more and say, and this is the part that makes me emotional. It's like, why would you tell somebody until you've suffered enough? Then, you know, when you've suffered enough, then you're worthy. You're worthy to recover. You're worthy to, you know, you've paid your price. And you know what? That has long lasting effects. And I didn't know until I was in long-term recovery, the long lasting effects that that whole belief system has of like bargaining for your worthiness and being told that like, you've done so many bad things that now you have to be a living amends for the rest of your life. And what that does is it makes, you know, you always feel like you have to be moving to like get something, to get something, to get this worthiness, to get here, you know? And if you're not, then what are you? You know, and then when does that end? When does the hustle for that worthiness to make up for all those years that you were sick, when does that end? I can tell you 13 years in, I don't know where it ends because it's still happening for me. And I'm 13 years, last last week, I had 13 years clean for my drug of choice. Congratulations. And thank I'm, you. And I'm sorry that you still feel that. It's, I mean, it's just something that's ingrained in us. And you know what else know, it also tells people is, is people uh, also punish themselves. Like you see people who are addicted, punish themselves. They're like, well, my family wants this, 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 and this of me. And what they're asking is just like a violation of human rights in general. You know what I mean? But people are like, well, that's what I deserve because I've done these terrible things and like, they can't trust me. And, and so we, as people who struggle with addiction, we punish ourselves. I can, I hear clients all day say, well, you know, that's what I deserve and that's what I have to go through. Why would we ever do that? Yeah. Amen. Let's go back to diversion for just a second. So when we see or hear about somebody selling methadone or buprenorphine or suboxone on the street, I, I hope that we think differently now and we don't just think, oh, they're just selling these so that somebody can get high. Aaron, when you hear, okay, if, if any of our listeners hear so-and-so got this on the street, what would you hope that somebody thinks? I would hope that they think the person who's buying buprenorphine, suboxone, methadone on the street, that they would think that that person's just trying to get well, as Ashanti mentioned, that they're just trying to not go through withdrawal and that they experience barriers because of our healthcare system. And that's why they couldn't get it legitimately. It's not because they just want to buy stuff on the street. People like to buy medication from like trusted sources, <laughs> even people who use drugs. Uh, so I would hope that they would see that that person's actually making efforts to get treated. And that's all that they would think about it. And then that speaks to an issue in our system. Our system is broken and it's preventing people. It's our system. I get very <sighs> mad at systems. Well, and it's just, again, it's just, I can't describe it any other way by, it's just a terrible, sad thought, but systems can change. And that's why we are having this show. That's why we do the work that we're doing because systems- And the drug war. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let's define abstinence. I think it's hard to- define abstinence because I think different groups of people in addiction conversations have vastly different definitions of abstinence. I will tell you mine, which is probably not one that's shared by many people who work in addiction treatment, 
but I would think it's maybe shared by other people who work in harm reduction. My definition of abstinence would be no more problematic use of your drug of choice. So that would allow a person to still use other drugs recreationally, as long as they're not using those drugs. So that includes alcohol, that includes illicit drugs, as long as they're not using those drugs in ways that meet the definition of addiction, which is a definition that requires people to meet clinical criteria defined by the American Psychiatric Association. And there's 11 of those criteria and they are the things there are things like the ways in which addiction greatly disrupts your life, right? So if people can use substances recreationally without it greatly disrupting their life, without it putting them at serious risk of, of death, um, then I see no problem. I know that that's not a definition of abstinence that a lot of people would agree with, but that's mine. I think that's beautiful. Ashanti, what do you think? What's your definition of abstinence? Mm-hmm. I, I feel so happy right now because my my definition of of abstinence is really not using your drug of choice. It really is. Um, I grew up in a family where addiction is kind of prevalent, right? And I happen to have family members in my life that are still active in addiction. And really, I get to just see like, hey, if you didn't do this one drug, but you're still drinking, or you're still smoking weed. I'm like, dude, you are doing huge things with your life. You I know what it takes to not use heroin. I know what it takes to not use methamphetamines. I know what it takes to not drink alcohol. Unfortunately for me, all of those are my drugs of choice, right? So abstinence for me looks like I don't get to use any of those drugs, but that's because all of them were my drugs of choice, right? So I know what it takes to be abstinent. So if you're not participating in your drug of choice, I'm proud of you. I'm so proud of you. If that means that you are on Suboxone because Suboxone helps you maintain, if you are on any one of those drugs that help you maintain that, you are totally living in sobriety to me. You know, it might not be the definition of abstinence, but you are living in sobriety to me because you are doing something for your life that's making it greater. And that's what it is, you know, like that's where, that's where the importance is to me. So abstinence looks like every single human being different, you know? That was so beautiful. Abstinence looks like every single human being different. Mindy, what do you think? God, it's hard for me because like my head tells me one thing, you know, but I've been ingrained. And I've been socially conditioned through Alcoholics Anonymous and through my own experiences of treatment, what abstinence has to be. And so like, to me, when I hear abstinent, I think abstinent from all mind and mood altering substances. But then even within that, I have like my own exceptions. Okay. Because like within Alcoholics Anonymous, right? Like there's a huge chunk of people in Alcoholics Anonymous who just that all mind and mood altering substances is like alcohol and drugs. Right. So to me, abstinence is like abstinence from from mind and mood altering substances excluding medications that are prescribed right so when i think of somebody who's abstinent i do think of people who are abstinent from alcohol and drugs illicit drugs however that it's something that that's conditioned in me and god it's just so hard because i don't equate abstinence and recovery though i think that's where it is that goes off the rails for me abstinence means this to me but abstinence is not recovery to me it can be. That was my path of recovery for nine years, right? But that's not my path. Of, and well, I'm recovered today, like, you know, and so, and it's not everybody's path of recovery either. So abstinence and recovery are not, um, I don't consider them mutually exclusive, but I do. So I don't consider, uh, I don't believe you have to be abstinent to be in recovery, but I do consider abstinence to be abstinent from drugs and alcohol. And that might change for me. Like when you guys are talking about your definitions, I'm like, that makes total sense. You know, but like in my little heart and soul, you know, I've been too conditioned 
I was a very religious member of Alcoholics Anonymous for nine years. Like I'm super conditioned and some of that stuff's not going away. Well, thank you for being so honest again. I mean, I really appreciate everything everyone's saying. We need to take one more break. When we come back, let's talk about the, the types of treatment options that are out there for Utahns and you know some of their resources. And um, we'll go from there. We'll be right back. The Debunk Podcast is made possible by our members and the Emma Eccles Jones College of Education and Human Services. Committed to quality teaching, outreach, and research. Offering services to the community and providing students with real-world service and research opportunities. Information at cehs.usu.edu. Welcome back to Debunked. The myth that we are debunking today is the only legitimate treatment for addiction is abstinence. Earlier in the show, we talked about medication for addiction treatment, how long it's been around, what it is, some of the barriers to treatment. We talked a little bit about diversion and the efficacy of these drugs. Let's talk about the resources that people have in Utah. What are some of the different types of, you know, uh, treatment that people can receive here or just, you know, support that people can receive in Utah? Mindy, can you speak to that? Yeah. So if people are looking for, um, well, we have tons of options for treatment. Well, that's a lie. In Salt Lake Valley, we have tons of options for treatment. As soon as you get outside of the Salt Lake Valley, your options begin to thin. And the further you get away from the city center, the thinner your options get, Can I just right? validate what Mindy is saying really quick? We just put out a fact sheet through Utah State University Extension. And basically it shows that the Wasatch Front, so Salt Lake Valley, Utah County, all of the methadone clinics are right there on the Wasatch Front. And they are not in any rural counties, um, mm-hmm. which if you look at Carbon County, has the highest rate of overdose, but there's no treatment center. No. Right? There are some providers for buprenorphine, so people who can prescribe, mm-hmm. physicians, uh, nurse practitioners, et cetera, but there are not methadone clinics. They're all on the Wasatch Front. So it's a huge geographic barrier right there. Oh, I have to tell you. That. Okay, so they have started getting some methadone to some places. So Carbon County is one of them, right? So Project Reality, which is like the main nonprofit uh, methadone provider in Utah, they had started a methadone program, but then it got handed over to Four Corners Behavioral Health. So part of the problem in Carbon County and in all rural areas is that we have a Medicaid monopoly. We allow for one provider in an area, which in that area, it's Four Corners Behavioral Health. And every person who has Medicaid, so that means all low and no income individuals are being told that they have to continue to go to this one behavioral health provider and whatever requirements they may have. So if somebody gets kicked out of Four Corners, if they grew up with those therapists and they don't want to work with them, if they've already failed out of Four Corners three times, or they just don't want to do Four Corners, they don't have a choice. They don't have a choice. And in fact, if they go to one of those other providers, because I know those providers for Suboxone. So if they go to one of those other providers and they have a certain type of Medicaid, that provider and the patient are both going to get a letter from Medicaid, from Utah State Medicaid, saying they have to go to Four Corners Behavioral Health. And if they don't, then they don't get anything. And that is the case in every rural county and in every county, period, in the whole state of Utah. In Salt Lake County, Optum is willing to, like, they will, uh, like, they subcontract that Medicaid contract to other providers. So there's multiple providers that can provide for Medicaid. But yeah, there's a Medicaid monopoly here in the state of Utah, and we have to change it. So because there's another Because no barrier. patient should not be able to have a, ch- a choice of providers, period. But, and then down in, down south, like Cedar City, they don't have a methadone clinic. So people have to get bus from Cedar City to St. George, which is 45 minutes at five o'clock in the damn morning. Tooele doesn't even have a methadone clinic, do you? They have a couple of Suboxone providers though. Two Suboxone providers is not enough. What are some of the resources for people? There is, we did finally get Medicaid expansion here in Utah. So people who can't afford treatment are absolutely eligible. M- most if not all, will be eligible for Medicaid expansion, which will then help you pay for treatment, which will help you pay for medications, including methadone, suboxone, any of those. Um, I wish we had more resources for detox. But we just don't. You know, we have uni, we have VOA. That's really it. So we have those two resources for harm reduction. We have the Utah Harm Reduction Coalition, One Voice Recovery, Utah Naloxone, and Utah Naloxone also has a drug user health clinic. So there's lots of really great resources. We wish we had more, but we are doing the best we can with what we've got. And 
there's a lot of people out there that want to love and support all of these lovely folks. For detox facilities, I've made some really good connections. So there's like called New Vision and they take adult expansion. And there's one in Bountiful, that hospital, I think it's Lakeview. They take Medicaid and I think, oh, Provo Canyon, they take Medicaid and they all do detox and they all do medically assisted detox, which is phenomenal, right? Uh, Ashanti, why is it so great that people can get detox now? When you are able to detox from the substance, then you are able to, if your next choice, if the, if your next step is going into treatment, right? Sometimes it's not, sometimes it's just going home and trying to figure things out that way, you know, but if your next step is going into treatment and you can detox, then you are able to go in there and fill your body again, right? I like to imagine when you are using drugs is that you're kind of pushing your spirit or your aura, whatever that is, out of your body because your body is holding all of this. Well, for me, it was emotional pain and just like mental pain and anguish, right? So it pushed my energy out of my body and I was kind of like zombie-like. So detoxing is almost letting that energy come back in and starting to like feel, you know, that's why everything hurts. And that's what I tell my clients. That's what everything hurts. Your whole entire body hurts because you're actually letting and feeling your energy back inside of your physical body again. But I mean, that's just my, my weird way of describing it. No, I don't think that's weird at all. I think it's beautiful. I think it's really beautiful. Does detox have to be painful? Like does someone have to suffer in order to detox? I think that when you're detoxing, there is like this thought of suffering. I don't want people to suffer through detox. I would love it if they were medically assisted and they had something that helped them sleep and had something that helped the nausea go away and had something that helped the headache go away and the diarrhea go away. And, you know, and so People themselves think, oh, if I do it this way, I'm going to get addicted to that. And then I'm not going to be able to get off this when, when I'm like, dude, give yourself, give your body a break for a moment, a time to relax and recover, you know, actually get some water inside of you, actually get some food inside of you, actually, you know, take the time to, to feel better and then, and then continue on this journey of whatever that looks like to you, you know? Yeah, thank you. Mindy, can you quickly tell us about Utah uh, Harm Reduction Coalition? And then Ashanti, can you tell us about Warrior Spirit um, so we can put these resources up on our social media? So Utah Harm Reduction Coalition, we have the largest syringe exchange in the state of Utah. We provide services in Salt Lake County, Weaver County, Tooele County. And Tooele County, we've had that one running almost as long as the Salt Lake County one. That one's been running this year. It'll be four years or this, like in the next two months, it'll be four years. Um, So we also provide harm reduction based outpatient treatment, which means the abstinence does not have to be your end goal for recovery and it's not a requirement to start treatment. We also provide, we help people get signed up with Medicaid and uh, we link them, we do free hepatitis C and HIV testing, linkage to free treatment. Um, I mean, whatever we can do to help you, we will. And Warrior Spirit is where we send people out into Willow for treatment. Thank you so much. I'm so grateful for all of the work that you do. Mindy, that's that's amazing. I almost died when I found out you guys were opening. I was I've never been so grateful for a treatment in my whole entire life. Seriously, never. Like Tooele has horrifying rates. Like I said earlier, horrifying rates. I'm everything. It's it's the only place outside of New Mexico. So I and Erin's in New Mexico, so she knows this. When I learned to do syringe exchange, I went to New Mexico and I trained with the New Mexico Department of Health because New Mexico has some of the most advanced drug policies in our whole country. They passed one of the best naloxone laws like 20 years ago. Their syringe exchange has been legal and required of all of their health departments for like 20 years. It's crazy. And in New Mexico, there is horrifying things that I've seen that have scarred me for the rest of my entire life when I learned to do syringe exchange there. And you're looking around at just dirt for as far as the eye can see and the wind blows. You just see like tumbleweeds going down and there's not even a store for 50 damn miles. 
So you're seeing these people have no resources and out for exchange comes a grandma, a mom and her kid and all three are exchanging. And I had never seen that before. And I'd never seen people with just so little, you know, and like, it's sad. There are people with no running water and no electricity in New Mexico. And I did not know that occurred anywhere in the United States. And it's just not right. And Tooele is the next place I ever saw that. And I can't believe that that happens right down the road from me. But we have a lot of intergenerational substance use in Tooele. But still, like the work you do, Ashanti, is just so grateful for it. And so are those people out there. They've been begging for you guys for a long time. Ashanti, can you tell us about the work you're doing with Warrior Spirit? Um, yeah, definitely. Warrior Spirit Recovery is a tribally owned treatment center in Tooele, Utah. Um, we are owned by the Skull Valley Band of Goshoots. And I am, oh, you have no idea the amount of love that I have for the company that I work for. We are really a unique environment. Um, it's not a typical 30, 60, 90 day program. We ask you once you're there to just really spend time and dig down and find out whatever is going on in those behaviors that you're having that keep reoccurring and messing up your life, um, dig down and, and find a way to work through them. Um, we have very, very open-minded doctors that work with us. And I'm extremely passionate about meeting you where you are. So upon admissions, I will work diligently to try and make sure that you are suited with what you need, right? So if you are on Suboxone, that is going to be brought up and I will find ways to make sure that you can continue that path to your sobriety or whatever those things are, you know? And so I'm just so grateful for what Warrior Spirit does. We do inpatient. We are working on um, an outpatient service. We have sober living and we have our own clinic with our own doctors and our own nurse practitioners. I'm just, I'm so grateful for what we do and just our unique approach on, on meeting people where they're at and, and trying to help them recover. So uh, Friend, how many, when did you guys open the Sober Living? Oh, we, Sober Living has been part of our program. So you actually have to go through the inpatient to get to the Sober Living. Yeah, but I mean, you know, we're working on it. I'm like, give me some time. I'm, uh, you know, <laughs> I'm working. I'm just so excited that literally, again, now we're back to this, this leaves <laughs> them the only Sober Living in, in Tooele. And Tooele County actually is the largest county in all of Utah. So Tooele County geographically covers more area than any other county in the whole state of Utah. It goes all the way to the Nevada border, which also we don't even talk about Grantsville, all the other towns. These people are so isolated. Man, Shanti, thank you for the work you do. Thank you. Man. Yeah, you guys are just, you guys are warriors. You're all champions. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm really grateful to be privileged to work with you and to talk with you and to share these experiences with you. All of the, the resources that we talked about today, um, we can, we'll have those up on our social media, on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, at Debunked Pod. So you can find those if you'd like. Guys, this has just been an enlightening, emotional, moving experience. And I'm, I'm so grateful that we've got together for this discussion. To end, Mindy, can you talk to us about your, you know, the, the personal experiences you've had, the personal loss. And if you could go back with the mindset that you have with harm reduction and um, with medication for addiction treatment, you know, the things that you know now, what would you do differently or how would it be different for you if you could go back in time? So one thing is, is so my sister, she died August 24th of 2014. So that was the same time that we were fighting for, I think, the third year in a row about Medicaid expansion. And I finally, for the first time ever, had my sister, like, she was willing to go to treatment. She was willing to even, I mean, she actually wasn't even willing to admit she was a drug addict, but she was willing to take a look at the fact some other things needed to be looked at, you know? So all I need. I need this much. I need this much. And that's all I need, you know? So, um... But my sister can't get into treatment because she didn't qualify for Medicaid at the time because we didn't have Medicaid expansion. So she didn't qualify for Medicaid. She didn't 
Obamacare, like the Affordable Care Act didn't open, open enrollment until November 1st and my sister died August 24th. So looking back and even still today, like the one thing we need is we need funding for treatment. People should be able to access treatment and it should not have to be the criminal justice system. And that is something that most people who struggle with addiction also have internalized is that, you know, that you should, you know, the laws or you should be punished until you get sober. And like, that's a bunch of crap. You know, the, the criminal justice system inflicts so much pain and unnecessary traumas and difficulties onto everybody, everybody. I was in drug court. I'm so grateful for drug court. I love drug court. And like, People who go into drug court, they have to be here, 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 and here at this exact time. And then your job has to work around it and everything has to work around it. And if you give a dilute or anything like that, like you're going to jail and you know what happens when we send people to jail, they lose their jobs and they lose their housing and they lose all the things that they have to get up for every single day. You know, so there's a lot of things that we really need to change. We need to change the way that we are dealing with people we need to help people build better lives i truly believe that addiction can be treated entirely if we heal the traumas of the past learn new coping skills reduce risk factors like homelessness lack of jobs separation from family and children and society and we increase protective factors like giving people employment housing reconnecting people with their community giving them purpose and something to live for you know what i mean and those things should not be contingent upon abstinence. What was that like when your sister passed away? What did, you know, can you describe the loss to us a little bit? It is, it's the most difficult thing I've ever been through in my entire life. My sister was, uh, she was very theatrical and very into drama and dramatics and theater. She had a bumper sticker that said, thespians do it best on stage. <laughs> <laughs> my sister was the best and you know what there's no one in my whole life that's ever loved me the way that she does and like that's the thing I miss the most so I just miss the way she loved me you know but uh that day I was going to Wicked my daughter and I had like second row tickets to Wicked and they were $300 a piece and uh I knew my sister would still want me to go and at the very beginning of Wicked the sister dies and I was like what you know, and I just sat there and just cried and cried and thought, how could this sister die here? My sister died 30 minutes ago. But I just, I remember pulling up to get my massage that day. And, you know, my sister wasn't, I didn't know she had gone yet. And I got that call and my mom was like, she just started screaming, your sister's dead, your sister's dead. And I remember the cop getting on the phone and I told him, you have to bring her back to life. She's the only big sister I have. Like, I need you to save her. And he told me it's too late. She's already at the morgue. And I was like, how do I get to her? I need to get to her. You know, and I just remember like this hopeless feeling of like I need to save her life. Like if I can just get to her, I can save her. And I couldn't, you know, and like there is nothing worse than like going to pick out a casket for your sister. Even more so because there's like baby caskets in those pictures and that's horrible, you know, but it's like all the things that she, people treat overdose like it's an end thing, you know, like, like once somebody's overdosed and died, they're a statistic and that's the end of it, but that's not the end of it. That was the beginning of it for me. You know, my sisters missed my son graduating high school. She missed my daughter graduating kindergarten. She missed me going through a divorce. She's missed everything I've ever done in her honor. And every day that she's gone, it's still just the day she left. You know, and that's the thing that people forget is that the, those of us who lost people to overdose, we're still missing them every single day, long after you counted them five years ago in your tally of people who died. Every day she's missing. She's not making the Thanksgiving turkey that she's supposed to make because I burn myself and hers are juicier. She's not making my Oreo balls at Christmas. It's like, it's all those things that like, I don't ever get to have with her again. You know, and like when people fight about recovery that's the that makes me so mad is because it's like how dare you try to tell anybody anything that could possibly take away somebody that they love and then people will have the audacity to tell me something like oh I know how you feel I lost my grandma shut your mouth my sister was 38 years old you know she went to bed the night before a normal person and she died while she was sleeping you know and like no, she was supposed to live another 40 years to be a grandma. 
you know, and so we just, we really need to preserve these lives. I don't ever want anybody to go through what me and my family have gone through, you know, and not even to mention all the other burdens that come with that, you know, like a funeral is very expensive and none of us were prepared to pay for a funeral. And those are the kind of things you don't even think about. Do you know what it's like to be planning a funeral and knowing that your sister deserves everything in the whole world, but you don't have enough money to give it to her? You know, like these are the things that people don't even think about when they think about overdose. I had to save my money for like a long time to get my sister the exact headstone that she deserved. And I shouldn't even be buying her a damn headstone, you know? She should still be here with me. And these are the things that people don't think about when they think about, these are not statistics we're talking about. These are people's lives. These are human beings, human beings that for the rest of our lives now, it's not the same. My kids have to go without the rest of their lives without their aunt. Because I'm missing out on a lot, especially the Oreo balls. <laughs> My sister would appreciate that I said that to you. <laughs> Gosh, thanks. Thanks for letting me share that. Because it's important. People don't understand exactly what we lose when we lose to an overdose. People don't understand. And that's why it's so important that we, you know, debunk this myth that yes. the only legitimate treatment for addiction is abstinence because it's so dangerous. It is so okay. dangerous. And it's so dangerous, you know, the structural social barriers that we have in our society preventing people from getting this treatment. And yes. my heart breaks for you. I'm so sorry. Thank you. Thank you. My sister was the greatest. And you know what? So she had a pain pill addiction. For like 15 years. My sister was Mormon, right? And she never smoked a cigarette. She never drank alcohol. She's never smoked pot. And my sister died of a heroin and suboxone overdose. Doctors over prescribed her for like 15 years. But then you know what happened? People started going, oh my God, the opioid crisis. And what did we do? We put pressure on doctors. We said, you better not prescribe. You better not prescribe. And guess what happened? They told my sister, we have to cut you off and you're going on suboxone. And my sister was not in a place emotionally where she could do that. She couldn't do it. Not that she didn't want to. She literally couldn't. My sister had so much trauma and such a lack of coping skills, a lack of self-esteem. So many things that I know about that people don't. And if she could have, she would have. And she couldn't. You know, and after a week of being on Suboxone, she was begging every day, begging my little brother, please help me. I'm still sick and it hurts and I just can't do it. Please help me. My sister died from $10 worth of heroin and one dose of Suboxone. My sister can take enough opiates to kill an elephant. We can't force people to get off drugs before they're ready to. My sister didn't have the skills to do so, which makes me so mad that people would say, now's your chance. Like you have to do it right now. And this medication is going to do it for you. No, Suboxone is not going to heal your trauma, buds. Not going to heal your trauma, you know, and it's not going to give you coping skills. It's going to help you not be dependent, you know, and, and had my sister had other things in conjunction with that Suboxone, maybe it would have been you know, effective, but it wasn't, it was part of what killed her because she wasn't at that place. And that happened because we don't listen to patients because we all know better than everybody else does for their life, you know, and we have to stop doing that. Yeah. Yeah. I wish you guys all could have met Maline. She's the greatest. She was the greatest. I feel, Man, like, I've I met, her so I feel much. like I've met a little bit of her. Oh, okay. Kim, I really feel like you would have really liked her. Like you would have loved her. Like gotten along. Malie, everybody loved Malene, but it, it, you know, she just, it's crazy because, you know, losing her taught me how to meet somebody where they're at. She is the reason I'm a harm reductionist. She taught me all of that. And I hate that it took losing her to learn how to love somebody in their dark and their light exactly how they are. But that is what she taught me. And sometimes I guess people can only do it from somewhere else. Yeah. But and she's changed the world, at least the yeah. world I live in. <laughs> yeah. But I, but Mindy, and I know this is your hope too, but it's my hope that people don't have to, you know, change by losing a loved one anymore. Yes. We can save, we can save some of, some people from this heartache by saving lives. Can I say this again? Please listen closely by saving lives. Not by just saying, yeah, I wanna give you a medication or you know, I want you to have this birthday party or you know, something frivolous. No, this is saving somebody's life so that they can live, so they can keep living. I mean, 
I don't know how to paint the picture any clearer. And loving people. Love is the answer. And you know what? That's one of the greatest things I ever learned in 12 Steps is when I was in 12 Steps, I was blessed enough to be amongst many people who loved me until I could love myself. And that's what everybody deserves. They deserve to be loved exactly as they are in all of their hideousness because we all have it, right? But love is the answer. If we give people love and acceptance, it's amazing what people will do for themselves when they feel worth it. Amen. You know, we've said on the show before that harm reduction is compassion. And I think we need to throw in love there too. We need to say that harm reduction is compassion. It's love. And I think we're going to learn that it's a lot of things, but those two have to be the most, those two have to be the most important, love and compassion. And I hope I never stop caring. Yeah. I hope I never get to that place where I can talk about the loss of these people who meant so much to me and not even get teary eyed or my voice get shaky, you know, because I've learned through being a therapist that you can be very emotional and be very much in control. And there's not something wrong with being emotional. And I hope I never get to that jaded place that I see so many people at people. You know what people tell me all the time? They're like, you know, Mindy, it's just, you're just so passionate. And they say it like it's a bad thing. And it's like, you know what? I hope I never stop being passionate about human lives. And you know what? These people are worth fighting for. My sister was worth fighting for. Ashanti's worth fighting for. I was worth fighting for. And look at what, you know, look at like just me and Ashanti, you know, the two of us, we're both, you know, recovered people. So like, look at what we've done with our lives, you know? And it's like, it's not because we're so special, you know, and there's no reason why I got to recover and other people shouldn't. I'm not so special, but I do give it back. And I think that's why God let it be me, you know? And like, we do give it back and we were worth it. And we were worth it then and we're worth it now. And the people we're helping, they're worth it too. And wait till you see what these people give back because I've never ever seen any group of people in my life give back the way people in recovery give back. You know, so I'm just, I'm so grateful and we give back and we, we make the world a better place than we found it. But people don't get that opportunity when they're dead and they don't get that opportunity when we restrict their ability to recover. People deserve to recover in whatever way they want. I'm sorry, I keep going off. Well, I just want to thank all of you for being emotional, for feeling like you can be vulnerable enough with me, with our team, you know, and, you know, with the world, with the public to save lives. I just really, really appreciate you being vulnerable with us. So thank you. Um, We heard some incredibly moving stories from Ashanti and from Mindy about why this myth about abstinence is is so dangerous. I mean, it's dangerous because it prevents, you know, it, it prevents people from seeking treatment that is life-saving treatment. And, and we're tired of seeing people die. We're tired of hearing about families who have to go pick out caskets and who have to keep having Thanksgivings and Christmases and birthdays without their loved ones. And it has to stop. It just, it just has to stop. So this myth has to be debunked and we need to push a different dialogue. It needs to be that people, you know, people who are sick need to be met where they're at. And that is the expectation. We need to treat them with love and compassion, meet them where they're at, save their lives, help them get better, you know, improve their health in the ways that is possible for them in that moment at that time. Thanks for joining us today on Debunked, the only Utah podcast combining evidence-based health practices with storytelling to challenge the stereotypes and debunk the myths about harm reduction, opioids, and substance use disorders. I'm Tim Light, and today we debunked the myth that the only legitimate treatment for addiction is abstinence. Join us for episode 8 on August 12th, where along with award-winning podcast host Garth Mullins, we will be debunking the myth that methadone and suboxone are no different than heroin. Today we talked about Medication for Addiction Treatment, or MAT, how long it's been around and some of the barriers preventing people from utilizing and accessing MAT. We also talked about different types of treatment options for substance use disorders, and we highlighted specific resources right here in Utah. And lastly, we heard Ashanti and Mindy's stories. You can find the resources we talked about on our social media at DebunkedPod. Speaking of social media, check us out on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube at DebunkedPod or on our website at bit.ly forward slash DebunkedPod. 
don't forget to rate and review. And don't forget to tell all your friends about Debunked and remind them that they can find the show on the podcast app, Spotify, UPR.org, and anywhere else they get their podcasts. Debunked is produced in collaboration with Utah Public Radio. Funding for the show comes from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, the Office of Health Equity and Community Engagement, the Utah State University Department of Kinesiology and Health Sciences, and Regents Blue Cross Blue Shield. Our editorial board is Jay Hymas, Adam Baxter, Ashanti Moritz, Savannah Ely, Dr. Sandra Solzer, Dr. Suzanne Prevedel, Dr. Aaron Fanning Madden, Mindy Vincent, Patrick Rizak, Michelle Chapus, Dr. Marin Voss, Dr. Amy Kahn, Trisha Glass, Lloyd Arrive, Hilary Deesh, Jennifer Petrus, and Susie Baker. Debunked is produced by Nick Porth, Jelaine Smith Needham, and Fred Weller, with Nick Porth serving as lead producer. Our creative specialist is Autumn Gibbs. Music for today's episode was created by Nick Porth. Our science advisor is Dr. Aaron Fanning Madden, and our program directors are Dr. Sandra Solzer and Dr. Suzanne Prevedel. I'm Tim White, host and editorial board member.